It is time for us to get into the last two episodes of season four of The Chosen. Of course, these are just our overviews. And remember, we're going to be doing deep dives on all of these episodes coming in the next few weeks as The Chosen finally releases these episodes on the app and everybody gets to see. That's when all bets are off. We're going to be talking about every single spoiler out in the open and talking about little details all throughout the entire season and especially breaking down all of the scripture. There is so much in this season that I cannot wait to talk about. So make sure you're subscribed like this video and let's jump into episode seven of season four so the episode begins with a flash forward we see a mysterious character as he walks up the side of a mountain with a staff now as he's approached by a woman with red hair at the entrance of a cave she kind of warns him off and says who are you uh, kind of threatening him with a bow and arrow now as he takes off his hood we see that this is matthew we knew that this was going to be a flash forward, of course, because we had gotten some hints earlier on. Mary Magdalene, for example, had given a monologue in one of the trailers that was clearly from a future timeline, past the time when Jesus had died, and understanding everything that he had gone through. So this is definitely that flash forward. Then we hear from the back of the cave during this conversation that Matthew is having with this woman, the voice of Mary Magdalene asking what's going on. Now, while this woman with red hair, as far as we know, is not a biblical character, her name is Atiana, and she's obviously being a helper to Mary Magdalene here in the wilderness as Mary is in hiding. Now, I don't believe we get an exact year of when this takes place. This could be around the messenger's timeline. My guess is that it's a bit after that. It's obviously a bit further in the timeline than we saw in the season two flash forward, as little James was obviously still there giving his story, uh, talking about Jesus during that time. So. Uh, we're going to talk about little James in just a second as well. There's a lot of really interesting things with him. Now, Matthew comes to Mary Magdalene because he's finally finished his gospel. Now, as our Bibles are very thin and kind of tightly knit and very small lettering, of course, his Bible is very, very big. And this is just the book of Matthew. Uh, this book by itself is very, very large. But of course, it would have been written over many pieces of parchment over a long period of time. And so this is what Matthew's gospel looked like then. Of course, we don't have the original first Matthew's gospel. We have many manuscripts scripts from later on, uh, but not the original. It would be really cool if we did, though. Now, some key things that Matthew shares here is that he knows that this book will outlive them, at least, but he also has some bad news to give to Mary Magdalene. And of course, she's used to getting bad news at this time. A lot of people are dying. The church is really being persecuted at this time, not only by the Romans, but also by the Jewish uh, leaders. And so there's a lot of stuff going on here. That's why Mary Magdalene and Matthew are in hiding in the first place. And right as Matthew says, I have some bad news that I wanted to deliver in person. She says, who is it? Obviously knowing exactly what's coming here. Someone has died and Matthew is about to give the news. And he says that it's little James. And she wants to know how it happened, although Matthew is kind of hesitant to tell her because... Well, he doesn't want to share all the badness of it. He doesn't want to relive it. And he doesn't want to tell her and have her worry about it. But she insists because she wants to know how it happened, where it happened. She, she needs to be informed here. So Matthew tells her that he died in lower Egypt and the king had him impaled with a spear. Now, this is something that's really interesting. We'll talk about this more in our deep dives, but we don't really know how all of the apostles died. Although there are traditions that are held by different groups throughout history that tell us that the apostles went certain areas and preached the gospel or shared the good news in these different places. And so it really helps us to understand where they could have gone. Uh, and little James is one of those. And this story that they're using in the chosen is one of these traditional stories, I believe. Now, here's where we get a really cool connection to the New Testament, as well as little James in particular. We don't know if if all of the apostles were married or if they had kids or whatever else happened, but most likely the majority, if not all of the apostles were married because we actually have a moment from Paul in the New Testament that talks about this. He talks about how the apostles traveled their wives and how he could too, if he, if he wanted to basically, if he wasn't single, uh, but he is single. And so that's how he's going to stay. And that's kind of how Paul talks about it there. But in this moment here in The Chosen, we actually hear about Anya and the girls. That means that little James had a wife and at least two daughters. So really, really interesting stuff here showing that they did have families and they did kind of go further in their lives after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. And so the girls are actually safe. They weren't harmed. They weren't even in Lower Egypt when this happened. But they're actually being moved by Simon the Zealot's men to Colossae in order to be safe there with the church there. Paul is actually writing letters to the church at Colossae, which of course we know is Colossians. Then Mary Magdalene says that she's going to write a letter to Anya. And Matthew asks her, what is she going to write to her? And she says, he's no longer suffering. 
Now, of course, this is foreshadowing for this episode, as we're going to see a little bit more of Mary and little James later on. But we know that little James has this malady, and it's not being healed by Jesus. He asked him, and Jesus said no, and he explained why that is. And of course, little James has come to a more clear understanding of why that is. Not that he's 100% happy with that, but that it is the case where he is right now. And so we don't see little James complaining all the time that he's not getting what he wants or what he thinks that he needs, but he allows Jesus to work through him even in the pain, even in the midst of what he's dealing with. And so we're going to see that more and more. But now that he's dead, obviously, he's not suffering anymore. Then the attention moves back over to Matthew's gospel. Mary says she's going to be up all night reading it and reliving everything that they went through, even the hard parts. Then Matthew kind of redirects and tells her that he sees her desk over there, and it has a lot of different papers on it. Now, he sees that these are not just letters that she's writing to random people, but these are an accumulation of something that she's creating here. And she is quick to kind of say that it's just for her. And I think there's a very good reason for this. Obviously, in this cave, over however long a time she's been here, Mary has been writing things about their time. But this isn't Mary's gospel, and we have to be very, very clear about that. There is an apocryphal book that is written long after Mary Magdalene died that is Mary's gospel, and that is not something that we consider to be as canon. However, there are some people that could look into this and be confused by that. This was my only gripe about the beginning of this episode, is that as we see her kind of dive into this a little bit, and we're going to see at the very end of the episode as well, I love the way that they clarified, first of all, that this isn't for other people, it's just for her, and that she's just sharing it with Matthew because he's her longest friend, right? Um, her oldest friend. And so I, I get that portion of it, <laughs> but I do understand that a lot of people would be like searching for this piece of writing that Mary's sharing in The Chosen, since a lot of the times The Chosen brings us back to scripture, I think this could be a way in which people go and they find out uh, Mary's gospel and try to say that, oh, this is from that, or uh, that Mary Magdalene in the show is kind of uh, creating this new book uh, later on. And of course, we know that she didn't. Uh, and so, <laughs> I don't know, that's the only little gripe that I have with the beginning of this section here. That's when the intro song happens, and then we get into the rest of the episode. Now, coming back to present day, we pretty much pick up where we left off in the last episode, and that is Jesus telling them that they're going to Bethany and leaving Perea. This is everybody getting ready to leave for Perea. First off, we see as Simon the Zealot is actually making a couple of different staffs for the group. Of course, Big James is injured, so he could use some help kind of walking, and then Little James actually needs a new staff uh, as Simon Z kind of gives him a little bit of a better one here. Then here we see again as Little James is actually hurting pretty badly. He needs Mary Magdalene to help him to put his backpack on and to get ready for travel here. Now, he's not complaining, but he's definitely in pain, and we can see that here, which is going to escalate throughout this episode. Of course, this bolsters what we saw in the flash forward as Mary is starting to cultivate this relationship with little James that they've had for the last several years as they were one of the first to follow Jesus. They start to have some conversation about what is actually going to happen. All of the apostles are really confused about what Jesus is saying. He says in one moment that, Lazarus is asleep, and then the next moment he says that Lazarus is dead. And even though he's speaking to them plainly, it seems like things are a little bit off here, and they're not understanding in any way. So Mary says, well, we're not exactly sure what's going to happen. Either we'll sit Shiva, or we won't. Now here we get another walk and talk section with several groups of two beginning to have different conversations that are actually really interesting. First off, we have Thomas and John. Of course, at the end of last episode, Thomas was talking about how how he's ready to die with Jesus going back to Bethany and going back to Jerusalem. He said, we'll all die with him then. Now, this is something that does happen in scripture. However, the chosen definitely interprets this a lot differently than I do when I read it. And we'll go over that during our deep dives. But he's having this conversation with John about how basically he's ready to die. In fact, maybe a part of him in this conversation even me kind of wants to. He's a little bit depressed, obviously, with Rhema and everything that's been happening. And as he's been hearing this whole talk about Lazarus, 
he's kind of wondering what's going to happen here. Lazarus is dead. Is Jesus going to do something about that? If, if so, why wouldn't he do something about Rhema? And of course, we're going to get there later on in this episode. But at this point in this conversation with Thomas and John, Thomas is very much set on the fact that death is just a part of life, and we have to accept that. That's what Jesus has been teaching us. The next conversation that we have is with Peter and Big James. Now, Big James obviously had that injury from Jerusalem and came back to Perea and was laid on the table. During that time, he actually said something about Jairus' daughter, and he's kind of worried about that because obviously he wasn't supposed to share it, although it doesn't really end up to be a huge deal. Nobody really caught what he was saying. He has this conversation with Peter talking about that and saying, you know, they don't really have anything to worry about with this whole Lazarus thing. Like Jesus will take care of it. We trust him. And yet at the same time during this conversation, you kind of feel like Peter is worried about what's happening here. He's seeing how Thomas is reacting. He's seeing everything that's going on here. And he knows that if Jesus does raise Lazarus from the dead, there's going to be some big issues, not only with Thomas, but even outside the group, right? With the religious leaders and different things like that. So Peter, I think, is on full red alert. <laughs> He's kind of like looking out for everybody here, trying to see what's happening. Next, we get a really interesting scene between Nathaniel and Judas. Now, these two combined are really an interesting pairing because Nathaniel is so blunt and straightforward and honest, and Judas is very deceptive, but also questioning and doubting what Jesus is doing. And so these two together, together are a really interesting pairing because Judas is kind of, you know, approaching these questions and doubts and Nathaniel is just very much, you know, straightforward in his answering in, in these different moments. So Judas asked Nathaniel questions like, what was it like before I got here? And he says, quieter. <laughs> and he doesn't just mean Judas, although Judas can talk a lot. What he means is that things weren't as crazy. People didn't care as much about their group. It was very much quieter. Yeah, we were healing some people. Yeah, we were helping some people. Yeah, we were doing these different things and traveling around, but we weren't worried about the entire Sanhedrin coming after us or the Romans coming after us. Um, now it's a little bit different. There are a lot of different things that we have to worry about here and it's getting kind of crazy. And again, this is where Judas's doubts start to come in. He says, I know he's the Messiah, but we've dealt with a lot of different things. This is our third Shiva in less than a year. Shouldn't we be winning, not losing all the time? This sure doesn't look like the glory that I thought that the Messiah would have. And Nathaniel says, only Jesus knows what true glory looks like. Then the last walk and talk moment that we get is with little James and Mary Magdalene. Now, of course, we knew this was kind of coming with the foreshadowing of what happened earlier on in the flash forward, but now we really get a moment of the two of them together. Little James is questioning her, asking her what she meant when she said, either we'll sit Shiva or we won't. And of course, she begins to explain like, Jesus is going to do what he's going to do, so I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen, but I trust him in the process of it. This is when he brings up some of the things that he's been thinking about in terms of this as well, specifically a psalm of David, how long, O Lord? In the middle of this psalm, it kind of equates sleeping with death, the sleep of death, and he says sometimes that's interchangeable. So I guess only God really knows the difference between who's sleeping and who's dead, and Mary goes, you get it. That's exactly the point. And that's what we're going to see when we get to Bethany. Either we'll sit Shiva or we won't. Little James then asks her if this is what she expected following Jesus. And she, of course, says that she didn't expect any of this. Her life before was filled with darkness, nothing but darkness and little blips of light every now and then. But now things are flipped. All she experiences is light with little blips of darkness in between. And she's so grateful because of it. Now, she doesn't wish anybody lived the life that she lived, but it has given her more understanding, and she really sees the light for what it is now, instead of the darkness for what she was swallowed by earlier on. And then they begin to reminisce about when they first met and how Jesus introduced them a long, long time ago back in Season 1, Episode 2. Now, of course, we've been doing this a lot recently. It has been over three years since the beginning of The Chosen, and it's really getting intense now as they're heading into the last week, really, of Jesus's life, and of course, then into the resurrection and everything else. So there is not a lot of time left in this show, meaning that they're going to really stretch out these days in the next few seasons. For example, season five and season six are basically taking place over a week and a couple of days. So it's not very much longer for all of this stuff to happen. And each episode will be taking up 
sometimes less than a day, uh, which is very unheard of in terms of TV shows, for sure. Next up, we head back over to Bethany, where, of course, everybody is sitting Shiva. Lazarus was very popular, very wealthy, and, of course, a lot of people knew him. So there's tons of people in this house sitting Shiva with the family and mourning for Lazarus because he's been buried for four days now. So there's three days left of Shiva. So we see as Mother Mary and Mary are kind of holding each other and mourning here. We also see as Martha is over in the corner. Then a new guest arrives who we just met in a previous episode, and that would be Arnon. This is the father of Yusuf, who happens to be a large businessman in Jerusalem doing construction, but obviously he knew Lazarus somehow. And he comes in and he says hello to Martha and greets her with a somber greeting. This is actually, I think, the first time that we find out what Lazarus' profession actually was. Uh, Arnon says that he was a fine ironsmith. Now, we heard in the last episode as well that Lazarus had a vineyard, so maybe he runs a vineyard on the side and he's an ironsmith as his main career. I'm not exactly sure that we're super clear on that. If I'm wrong about that, please let me know in the comments down below, as I often am, <laughs> and uh, let me know what you guys uh, have heard or what you've seen about Lazarus in The Chosen specifically. Um, but it looks like he was an ironsmith and he worked with Arnon in construction, doing different things uh, around the area. Then we see as a lawyer comes out of the side room and talks about the money and what's going to happen now that Lazarus is dead. Everything's been taken care of, and of course the papers are in order, as Lazarus was very responsible and knew what to do there. So the lawyer tells Martha that she's going to be well taken care of as well as Mother Mary included in Lazarus's will as well which is very cool but in the side room there's actually a bit of money if they need something right now that's going to come into play a little bit later and the last thing that the lawyer says is that a message had just been relayed to him that he is coming and he's almost here now of course he's coming to Bethany that means Jesus and Martha knows that so she immediately goes out to go and talk with him. Hey, real quick, if you're enjoying this video so far and you wanna help support us to make more videos like this, you could donate five, 10, 25, or even $50 a month to help us to continue to make videos like this. I'm using gear that's very expensive. It takes a long, long time to make these episodes. And as long as we have support, I can continue to do things like this and other things such as traveling to Israel as my full-time job and bring those experiences to you guys. There's a ton of stuff coming up in this year, so you don't want to miss it for sure. Anyway, if you want to support what we're doing here, go to snipesupport.com, and that is the best way to help us to continue to do things just like this. All right, back to the video. Now, of course, Martha is in mourning, and she has a lot of pain from her brother's death. And the first thing that she says to Jesus is that if he had come earlier, he would not have died. And of course, they're pretty upset at Jesus because they sent word ahead of time to try to get him to come and help Lazarus. Not only that, but in between the time that he got the letter and Lazarus dying, he actually passed right by Bethany without even going to them at all. Of course, this isn't explained in the show, but we'll talk about this during the deep dive as well. Now, Martha is begging Jesus to help with the situation however he can. She doesn't really know what she's asking for, I don't think. And she's kind of confused by a lot of the different things that are going on here. Jesus actually says that your brother will rise again. And she says, well, I know that he's going to rise in the resurrection when we all rise up again in the end of, the end of days. But that's too long to wait. <laughs> and Jesus is like, that's not what I'm talking about. And she gets so confused. She's like, okay, I don't really know what's happening here, but you know, whatever, whatever you're going to do, like I, I trust in you. <laughs> While the writing here feels a little bit sporadic and kind of all over the place, it definitely fits the situation. Knowing that Martha and even Jesus are going through a lot of pain with Lazarus's death and everything that's upcoming. But Jesus is trying to explain that he's going to resurrect Lazarus, that he's going to raise him from the dead and that this is going to happen. And Martha is kind of confused about it. And so are the apostles and they're not really sure what to say or think or to do. But of course, this is when Jesus shares that he is the resurrection and the life and now that he's here physical death will not keep people from their eternal life anymore and he tells martha to go get her sister now during this kind of interlude here where martha is going to grab mary we see that the apostles are questioning as well First off with Matthew, he says, are we supposed to be understanding what you're saying right now? <laughs> and of course, this is a huge question. We know from scripture that they're being kept from understanding. And so no matter how Jesus tries to explain it to them, they're not going to fully understand until after he dies and is resurrected. Then they start to get a better idea of what is actually going on. And then even Peter starts to question. He's like agreeing with Matthew. Like, yeah, I was kind of thinking the same thing, but I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> like, not sure what's going on here. And then we see as several other people within the group are 
kind of questioning as well, but most of all, Thomas. He says he doesn't want to trust his hearing here because he thinks he heard Jesus say that he's going to resurrect Lazarus, but he doesn't want to believe that because he didn't resurrect Rhema. Why wouldn't he resurrect Rhema, but he would resurrect Lazarus? That doesn't make any sense. So there's a lot of questioning here, which we're going to dive into in a bit, but you can definitely see the apostles are rustled by this. They don't know what's going on, and they're questioning each other. All of them are kind of worried and wondering what's going on here. As Martha goes into the house, she grabs Mary and tells her that he is asking for her, and he wants to see her. And then as Mary leaves the house, of course, just like we see in scripture, they all say, hey, she must be going to the tomb to cry. She shouldn't be alone. Let's all go with her. And so all of the people that are sitting Shiva in the house go with Mary and Martha, and they follow them to the outskirts of the city, of course, the Eastern Gate, where Jesus is. Again, just like in scripture, Mary comes running out and she's crying to Jesus, telling him that if he had come earlier, then he could have saved Lazarus, he could have healed him, and she's crying and weeping, and everything is getting really, really emotional here. She specifically says, we sent word, we asked you to come, why didn't you come? And he says, I will show you. Where have you laid him? And during this time, everything kind of slows down. He sees Mother Mary and Martha and Mary of Bethany, and he looks around at the apostles, and he kind of just buckles. This is, of course, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. You told us it would be like that, with how you lived, the man of sorrows. Acquainted with grief. This is an intense moment for him. And he's not just weeping because his friend is dead, but everything is bearing on him, right? His apostles don't understand. He's frustrated about that. His best friend is dead. He's upset about that. And he is about to go and be crucified and tortured. And that is just in a week's time. So there's a lot that is upcoming. Now, we get some clarity on this, actually, at least from the Chosen's point of view, in the end of this episode, which we'll go over with Mary's kind of poem uh, slash writings that she's talking about. But here, we definitely see as Jesus buckles. And this is the first time that it's not Jonathan Rumi just kind of like shedding a tear or like happy crying or um, kind of... Uh, you know, having a, a rough moment, but he's really, really weeping. Uh, and so I think they did a really great job here kind of showing that emotion. And even the apostles are saying, like, we've never seen him like this. This is different. This is like something's happening here, you know? <laughs> um, and so they're starting to kind of pick up on a little bit of what Jesus is going through. As Jesus gets up, he puts his arms around Mother Mary, Mary of Bethany, and Martha, and they begin walking to the tomb through the city. Now, the apostles follow closely behind, and they're all kind of chatting, like, what's happening right now? What, what is going on? Where are we going? <laughs> and all of them are kind of confused, but of course, most of all is Thomas. He doesn't even want to go. He's afraid of what he's about to see, and he thinks that he knows. Although Thomas does eventually follow as well. Now, getting to the tomb of Lazarus, obviously, we know what's going to happen here, but it is very well done. Overall, this is a really, really, really interesting scene to see how people are reacting and what is actually going on and the jokes that are told after the fact. It's really, really cool to see. So we see as Jesus tells them to roll the stone away, but they don't do it immediately. Of course, Martha says, just as she does in scripture, hey, it's going to stink. Like it's been four days. His body's probably rotting. This is not a good thing to do. <laughs> and Jesus says, roll the stone away. Like, you know, this is a minor detail. Let me handle this. And of course, then they do roll the stone away. We see Simon the Zealot, Peter, Andrew, and Zebedee as they roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb. Then right after this, we see as Jesus yells, Lazarus, come out. Physical death does not interrupt our eternal life. Lazarus, come out. And of course, he does. Now, I loved the reactions to everybody seeing Lazarus come out. It's not just happy, like, yay, this is a cool thing that we see all the time. <laughs> it was very much like, this is terrifying. It, this is like a zombie walking out of a cave right now. Like, what is happening, you know? So everybody's kind of freaking out. You hear as a woman is literally screaming bloody murder. Um, and everybody is kind of like worried as to what's happening. Mary and Martha don't know what to think. They're kind of like overwhelmed and, and gasping, uh, crying here. And then we see as Jesus tells them like, hey, go take off the, the linen strips. And they begin to do that. And everybody sees that it actually is 
Lazarus here. Now, the three of them in particular, but really everybody here is overwhelmed by what's happening. They don't know how to respond, and they're all kind of freaking out here. Um, although I love these moments here, how it's it's not like a rushed scene. Feels really slow paced. By the way, this is one of the longest episodes that we've ever seen of The Chosen. I think the full runtime is like an hour and almost 20 minutes. Um, so it's pretty... Uh, pretty intense here to see uh, this moment here kind of dragged out as we see Lazarus and the sisters and everybody's reacting and talking behind Jesus and the apostles are wondering what's going on and we see as Lazarus is raised and this is one of the the key moments I think that they had to get right for this piece of scripture in particular is how the crowd reacts to Lazarus being raised overall. First of all, we see a Sadducee who is very upset, right? The Sadducees don't believe in resurrection, and yet he's just seen it. So this must be some sort of demon, right? <laughs> like, like this must be something that he cannot comprehend. Um, and, and so he goes and he tells the people in Jerusalem. Of course, we see him leave almost immediately as he's going there. Then we see as a lot of different people are questioning Jesus, including his apostles. We see as big James questions him and says, why are you doing this in front of so many people? Like, you know, obviously implying like, hey, you told us to not tell anybody the last time you did this, you know? <laughs> um, and so we see Jesus as he's saying, it's time, big James. Like, it is my time. My time has come. You know, we don't have to wait any longer. Now, this is where we get to some of the best acting, I think, in the entire series so far. Not just the apostles or Jonathan Rumi, but I think specifically Judas and Thomas, uh, they do an amazing, amazing job here. I think this version that we're seeing of Judas, of him getting so excited about what is to come, is so telling as to what we're going to see in the future here. He's expecting something very specific. He's expecting Jesus to start amassing this army and to go and attack Rome and to overthrow Rome and so that God can rule on the earth, right? And so that Jesus can be the Messiah King. And that's not what Jesus is going to get, <laughs> right? Judas is going to get something very different. He's going to be very upset by that. But in these episodes, this is before Jesus kind of goes and does everything that he's supposed to be doing. And so Judas is ready. He's like super excited that Jesus has done this in front of everybody that now everybody's going to know that Jesus is the Messiah and they can't deny it. And so this is going to bring unity. It's going to bring, you know, this army. It's going to bring everything. So you can see the beginning of Judas really getting excited here. We'll see a bit more of that in a later scene as well. Then we turn over to Thomas. Thomas during this scene is massive. Joey Vahedi, who plays Thomas, is the goat. I mean, he's just so good at this episode in particular, um, how he is breaking down and how he allows these emotions to be a mixture of a lot of different things. He kind of falls to the ground. Right. And as you think he's kind of crying, it's more of like out of anger, you know, someone tries to bring him water and he hits it aside and he doesn't want any of it. He looks up at Jesus and he's just like, crying and asking him these questions. Like it's less of a cry. It's less of a sadness. It's way more of like a, how dare you sort of thing? Like, how could you raise him, but not Rama? And then he even asks, how could you raise him and not Rama or your cousin, John? This is sick. That's what he says. So this is like a, a crazy moment here where man, Thomas is going through it, right? He's lost the love of his, of, of his life. And also he knows that the person that he's following could have brought her back, but he didn't. Now, obviously, there's a very specific reason why Jesus didn't bring her back. And that is, I think, because they're going to use Kofni, at least in this version of The Chosen, right? Um, they're going to use Kofni to be that person who is a catalyst towards um, securing Jesus' fate, right? I think that's going to be later on. I think Kofni is very much going to be in the crowd of people chanting, crucify him, crucify him uh, during Passover in, in, in Jerusalem. And so this is going to be a big moment here where we're going to see as Jesus is, uh, you know, in that spot, but that's not obviously going to be until season six, most likely. Um, but that is the, the building blocks that are being put in place, right? That's why Rama needed to die is to have Kofni be in the place that he is and to begin this sort of rejection by all men that Jesus has to go through. But just like we heard in the trailer, Jesus says this, Thomas, I don't expect you to understand now. I don't. What the father allows, what I allow in order to bring forth the father's will, it can be crushing for you. And yes, even for me. So this is a really key moment here, of course. Jesus trying to teach Thomas what's happening here. And this moment is just, yeah, it's just amazing. So if you haven't experienced it, 
Definitely, this moment is one of the key moments of the season. Huge, huge, huge stuff here. The conversation between Jesus and Thomas kind of ends like this, where Thomas says, it's too much, I don't understand. And Jesus says, I know. <laughs> and please stay with me, you'll understand in time. And so as this conversation kind of ends, we see as Jesus goes and he wants to be with Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and he allows Thomas to be comforted by his brothers, um, which we see there. Now on his way out, of course, many people have questions for Jesus. Peter has already dismissed most of the crowd, telling them to go home. And then Arnon actually comes up to Jesus to speak with him as well. He tells them that he made a Sadducee very upset and that he's going to make trouble in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, good. Arnon says, you don't care? <laughs> and Jesus says, I do care. That's why I did it. <laughs> and so he kind of, you know, clears up the air saying like this, I meant to do this. I know what's going to happen. And yeah, I'm ready for the outcome of what's going to be taking place here. And then the scene ends as Thomas is comforted by John and Mary actually looks into the tomb. Obviously, this is a foreshadowing as well as Mary will be at the open tomb a little bit later on. We get a small scene here with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus as, of course, they're trying to rejuvenate him, give him some medicines and some water and some food and just get him back to normal. I did love this scene, though, because they clarify kind of what is going on with Lazarus's body. Does he have a new body? Is everything fixed? Is he a perfect human now? <laughs> and the answer is obviously no. This is not the true final resurrection, right? This is the resurrection of his body from dead to life again, but back into a human body. He doesn't have a special body that's going to live forever. He's not immortal now. He's still human, but he is back to life, and this sickness is not the one that led to death. So here we see as Lazarus is doing things, like he's checking out uh, how he feels. He's obviously very tired and hungry and thirsty, but also he still has a click in his knee, that same you know sort of injury from earlier on in life that he has, and that same quirk of his human body. So that shows us this is not a true perfected body, right? Um, it's something different, and I'm glad that they clarified that here in this little small scene. They also ask him some questions, like if he saw any of their dead relatives or anything like that of course this is questions that we would ask too we do ask this to people who have had these near-death experiences or been you know technically dead and then come back or different things like that um, and so these are questions that we ask all the time but he says no he didn't see anybody it was like a long sleep that's all he could really say then they wondered about the resurrection and what that true resurrection is going to actually be like and he's like well if only we had someone to ask as jesus walks in the room and asks if he can talk to lazarus alone now mary and martha leave the room and they have a moment to themselves as Lazarus is kind of getting ready and coming back to life. Now this next scene that we get is kind of the weirdest scene in this episode. <laughs> Although I like it a lot, um, it is very strange to have this scene amongst all the other ones. So we have Mary and Martha as they leave the room with Jesus and Lazarus and they go back into the main room of the house where the dining room is and they sit at the table and they drink some wine together. Now this is a really interesting scene because we don't really know Mary and Martha that well. Um, we've seen them in a couple of different episodes now, and we're kind of getting to learn them, but this moment here is like a breath of fresh air throughout the rest of the episode. As Mary and Martha have been dealing with all of these things all day long, now they just get to take a breath, and it's like an exhale. <sighs> Finally, we get to sit and think about what's just happened. I love the cinematography here because the camera just doesn't move. This is a long one shot where Mary and Martha have dialogue with each other until the very, very end of the scene. And there's like one or two camera movements there. It's really, really interesting because this is not normal, right? This is not something that normally happens within the chosen that we've really seen before. The camera work is not like I am here where it's showing you, you know, the person and they're kind of like talking to someone else. The camera work is almost like a spy camera. <laughs> it's like up in the corner of the room looking down on them as they are kind of reminiscing about the day and talking about what's going on and what they're going through. And it's super interesting because it's almost like you're not supposed to see this, but the chosen is giving us an inside look into what's happening here. So it was a really interesting way of conveying this scene in particular. I wonder how many people noticed what was kind of going on there. It was kind of like after all of these things, after all this excitement, just a breath of fresh air, just an exhale at the end of the day in order for them to just catch up on what they've just run through. Um, and I don't know. I thought it was really, really cool. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below for sure. But of course, the main purpose of this scene is to get Mary to understand that Jesus doesn't need anything. He doesn't want any treasures from us. 
except for ourselves. And so we're going to get into that a little bit as well. We've seen this multiple times throughout all of the chosen so far, especially with Simon the Zealot, as Jesus says, um, I need you, right? It's not your skills. It's not your dagger. It's not all these other things. I want you. I need you. And so Mary is kind of recognizing that in her own way as well, as she wants to dedicate herself to Jesus as well. Then next comes the scene with Jesus and Lazarus as they get to reminisce and talk about what just happened today. Now, this is an amazing scene and I've already broken it down in its entirety. I've actually shown you the scene here on YouTube as the chosen released it last week. So you can go check that out on our channel right after this one if you'd like to. But the gist of this scene is that Lazarus and Jesus are figuring things out. Lazarus is finally understanding who Jesus is in his fullness and how much Jesus is going to have to suffer. This is not something that Lazarus takes lightly. It's not something that he wants to see or wants to have Jesus go through. This is very hard for him, extremely hard. But he knows that this is prophesied in Isaiah. It's prophesied in all of these Old Testament books. And this is the purpose why Jesus is here, right? And so he's realizing that and it really, really hurts for him to do so. Now, of course, they talk about these different things. And, and I love the line there at the end where Lazarus says, these were just words on a scroll, but it's different now with you. It's, 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 it's about you. It's flesh and blood, right? It's something different here. And so a uh, really, really cool realization moment for Lazarus in particular, as the apostles don't really get this moment. <laughs> and we're about to see that right now in the end of this conversation with Lazarus and Jesus. As Thomas and the apostles rage into the courtyard of Lazarus's house, Jesus and Lazarus look out the window and see as they begin to argue and fight, and especially Thomas as he's breaking things in the courtyard. Now, Jesus says, there's no way that he can listen to me right now. His brothers will have to carry him. Um, and so Jesus knows, like, hey, Thomas isn't going to listen to me. He's not going to accept what I have to say right now. Um, and his brothers are going to have to carry him through this through this time. But, you know, we'll talk eventually. We'll get to that moment. Uh, but now is not that time. And so Jesus continues on. He brings Lazarus to bed. And then we get to transition into this scene with the apostles, which may be my favorite scene of the series so far. So here we see the lowest point of Thomas. Thomas is raging. He's breaking pots and he's running around and he's talking about how it's unfair that Jesus would heal Lazarus, but not Rama or Peter's child or John for that matter. And so there's a lot of things that Thomas is going through and he's struggling with this whole situation. He's just raging and raging. And the apostles are trying to calm him down, trying to understand what he's going through, trying to have him understand what Jesus is doing here. But of course, none of them have a full picture quite yet. As Thomas continues to rage, we see as Judas actually steps in and he basically says that this is all a good thing. We need to put our personal grievances behind and we need to accept that we're moving into the future and that Christ is doing something amazing here. Now, while Judas is partially right, he's also wrong about how this is going to happen. And he's going to be in for a rude awakening whenever Jesus goes through everything that he's about to go through. Hearing Judas say that Thomas should just suck it up pretty much Thomas gets really upset and almost hits him and then he is escorted out of the room and he goes off to bed by himself while well, the rest of the apostles have a conversation here we see as Judas continues he says I hate what he's going through but after what we saw today this is huge this is going to unify everybody against our oppressors and this could be the biggest day in Israel's history this is a massive deal. Now, Big James during this conversation actually agrees with Judas for the majority of it. Remember all the way back to season two, when Big James talked about fighting the Romans and being ready to be an army. They've been preparing for this. They want to be an army and to fight, at least in Big James's mind and in Judas's mind. However, they're going to come to very different conclusions after they see what Jesus does later on. Of course, Big James being one of the foremost proponents for what happens with the gospel and being the first martyr, this is a pretty big deal for him, right? And he doesn't come to the same conclusion that Judas does of betraying Jesus. Philip even points that out to Judas, saying, I don't think this moment means what you think it does. Now, this is a scene that we're going to break down very deeply later on. I don't want to spend too much time on it here. It is one of my favorite scenes of the series so far. But the gist of it is that they're all arguing about what this means, where Thomas is at, and where Jesus is taking them. They're all worried about what is happening here and what's going to be going on in the future. Is Jesus making an army? Is he not? Who are the true sheep of Jesus? Is Thomas one of those? And there's a lot of different things kind of going on here. But in the end, 
it all is stopped by little James because little James is in a ton of pain and he almost buckles beneath the pressure as he almost falls to the floor if it weren't for Thaddeus holding him up. Now Thaddeus and Mary come on either side of him and the rest of the group is kind of dismissed as little James is dealing with this intense pain. They finally get him to sit down as everybody makes their way to bed and they talk about the pain that's going on here. And little James says, I guess you're right. We're not sitting Shiva. And the three of them have a small conversation. Of course, the three of them being the first three that Jesus called. And now they're here together at the end. And this is where soon begins. Then in the last scene of this episode, we return to our flash forward as Mary is reading out her writings to Matthew. This is where we get the majority of that monologue that Mary was speaking earlier on in one of the trailers, where she says, darkness is not dark to you. Darkness is not the absence of light. It's more uncontrollable and sinister. You were there, waiting. Because the darkness is not dark to you. At least, not always. The coming darkness was too deep for us to grasp. I remember you wishing there could be another way. And looking back, I do too. I still don't know why it has to be this way. The bitter often mingled with the sweet. You told us it would be like that. With how you lived. The man of sorrows. Acquainted with grief. Now, of course, this isn't an official writing that we see in the Bible or anywhere else, but it is something that is in the chosen here. And of course, they would have had their own thoughts and own writings that I'm sure would be lost to time. But it's a probability, although I don't really love it because of the reasons I shared earlier with the kind of different writings and different gospels that appear, like the Gospel of Nicodemus and the Gospel of Mary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. I do love what's being said here, though. If I just take it at face value in terms of the TV show, it's really, really, really good. A couple of lines that I really loved from this are, you wept not because your friend was dead, but because soon you would be, and we could not understand it. So Jesus wasn't crying at Bethany because Lazarus was dead necessarily, but because he would soon be dead. And it wasn't that he was crying because he would be dead dead or because he was going through pain, but because we didn't understand why he was going through it. We didn't understand what was going on during that time. That's why he was upset and overwhelmed. And I love this other line that she says right near the end of her writings as well. She says, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, a grief we didn't want to face. So we tried to look away and in doing so fulfilled your very essence, one from whom people hide their faces. But soon we couldn't hide from it any more than we could stop the sun from setting or rising. Just love that line. Then throughout all of that section there where she's talking about what she's writing down, she's like, you know, reading through that with Matthew, we're seeing a bunch of different things happen back in the present time. That's of course leading us into what she's writing about here. One, we see the religious leaders as they're woken up. So we see Shammai as well as Shmuel, and I think Yusuf as well, as they're all kind of woken up and told what's been happening in Bethany, what's kind of going on there. Jesus outside in the courtyard as he picks up some of the pieces of pottery that that Thomas broke the night before. We also see as little James is really hurting uh, in his bed and Thomas is very much still angry in his. Uh, we see John as he's looking over and Simon the Zealot as he blows out an oil lamp there as well. We're also reminded of Thomas's sundial, which will become a more important thing in the next episode as well. Then as Mary begins to talk about Jesus in her writings, we see as Jesus is holding those two pieces of the broken pottery from the night before and is kind of feeling all of this pain from how his apostles are feeling and what they're going through and how he can't get through to them and everything that's going to come up soon. Um, there's a lot that kind of holds weight in that moment as well. And then finally, we have a slow zoom in on the grave, of course, which is approaching and, uh, and, it's pretty intense as we get closer and closer to that. All right, so that is episode seven of season four of The Chosen. There is a lot to come 
talking about deep dives on this episode in particular. I cannot wait to get into all of it with you guys. Um, my guess is that it's going to be in April sometime uh, is when these episodes are going to come out, but we'll see. I don't know exactly, uh, but we'll have to keep an eye out and see what's kind of going on. It's only in theaters until this weekend, March 10th. So not very much longer to go see it in theaters. And then after that, I assume they'll release it on the app not long after. So we'll have to see. Thank you guys for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you want to support us, make sure to go to snipesupport.com. That always is the best way to help us to continue to make videos just like this. All right, we'll see you on the next one. Peace.